Okay. Very good. All right, Kevin. So now I have some questions. Some of them are following up from your talk and some of them are more general. Just interesting to hear your perspective on things. Sure. Um, so one question directly related to the talk is you spoke about a certain style of model and these uh, variational re recurrent neural nets um, with graph structures. And you talked a lot about soccer and basketball plays. Um, and obviously they must have much more powerful and other kinds of uh, applications. Maybe you could say something more about that, what, what you think they're yeah, doing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, you know, sports tracking is an important sub-problem. Uh, it's not, you know, there are some applications at Google where we want to analyze, you know, YouTube videos, um, for example, or in Google Cloud um, to help external clients. But I think we latched onto that domain mostly as like a microcosm. And someone asked me a question at the end, but how many players are there? How, mm -hmm. What if there's an unknown setting? So in the sports setting, it's a closed world. So it's it, it's a simpler scenario. In in the wild, like if you're looking at self-driving cars or you're doing some you know tracking, and, um, even just in, in your home and you want to know who's coming in and out, and you know if your members of your family come home or not, there might be new people. You know you have guests over, right? So um, you have to deal with the open world scenario. Where it's not, it could be new instances of an existing family, so new, uh, of a class, like new member, new members of um, of the person category come in. But there could be new kinds of things as well, right? So, you know, you meet a cat for the first time, like, or, or you know, mm -hmm. someone brings home an exotic animal or a, a new, like my wife, wife just got an iPhone XR. I've never seen an iPhone XR, right? Uh -huh. Looks like my iPhone XS, but it's bigger. Um, so there's a family resemblance, but you know, we're encountering new stimuli all the time and we learn to sort of create categories around them. So I think um, that's quite a long extrapolation from what, what we've been doing. But I think, dialing it back a bit, in terms of trajectory forecasting, I think, you know, predicting, you know, traffic scenarios where you want to do self-driving cars mm -hmm. is obviously an important one. Um, but I think other interacting agents um, uh, you know, you could be doing air, air traffic control or something you want to forecast. Or if you have a robot in the home and you want to predict how people are going to move so you can avoid bumping into them. Or logistics, you have a ro robots in a factory and you want to do scheduling. Mm -hmm. So, maybe a more specific question related to the talk I was thinking about afterwards. You mentioned that there was a, um, in the uh, the Unity, the simulator that was yeah. developed was actually quite a simple strategy, like a decision tree that was yeah. made. Yeah. Uh, if that was, fl imagine that became much more complex mm -hmm. and had all kinds of stochasticity in it and right. other things. To what extent, you know, would you, that seems like a nice test bed for your, your system, right? Exactly. So to kind of yeah. do that. So to what extent are you pursuing that angle? Yeah, so that's certainly something um, I'm interested in. Is like, can we reverse engineer the true generative yes. mechanism? Yeah, yeah. Because we created the generative right. mechanism, right? So uh, at the moment, I mean, this relates to your question about sort of maybe a latent question of yours about interpretability. Mm -hmm. So we have the graph structure, which is interpretable, but the black box update functions are just neural networks, right? So we're not explicitly modeling, you know, goals that these agents might have, right? The, we can predict where they might move, but we don't know. We can try to introspect those neural nets and see like what features they depend on, but it might be nice I mean, it'd be great if we could reverse engineer a structured representation mm -hmm. that is sort of inside the heads of these agents. And we know that there is one because we built the system that way. Right. So I think it's a great test bed for that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so now we'll pop up a level. So you, like myself, have been through many kind of iterations and different forms of the field through the years now. <laughs> um, and as shown, so one thing I forgot I should mention early on is that uh, as your intro, right? So you're the author of one of the best textbooks in the field and coming up with a new edition. So maybe you should say something about the new edition before we, I oh, ask my question. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so I'm working on the, the second edition. Um, I hope there'll be some draft available to the public, you know, later this year and then hopefully it will go to press sometime next year. Um, I told MIT Press earlier deadlines than that, but it seems to be slipping as a trade-off between working on the, work, the book and working on, on, on new research. Um, but you know, a lot has happened since 2012. Um, so, and that's the date that people often say is the beginning of the deep re learning revolution, right? The Krajewski and Hinton paper came out then. Um, 
and I think that was certainly the start of the most recent hype cycle. Mm -hmm. But I think beyond just you know the improvements obtained by scaling up neural networks, I think there's been methodological developments which mm -hmm. are novel, like you know GANs and progress in reinforcement learning, um, black box optimization, uh, amortized inference. In, I think is a huge thing because that really bridges the gap between discriminative approaches, which may use neural networks, mm -hmm. typically they do, and oh. generative yep. interpretable models, right? And it makes these, in, I mean, the biggest problem with interpretable graphical generative models has been inverting them. And now we can use neural nets to make that inversion mm -hmm. process much faster. So I, I like that combination a lot. Okay. So a side question. So the original book, the first edition, was already fairly thick. If you mm -hmm. add all this to it, is it a two volume? What's the plan? Yeah, that's there? a good question. I, I, in discussions, are you, are you pruning anything? Does anything no, get pruned out, or is it just additions? It's too hard to throw away <laughs> your old baby, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, and besides, it's. I, I mean, some things might be slightly less relevant, but um, like I was tempted to drop the structure on graphical model structure learning, but. People are still doing that. I mean, I talked today about yes. learning sparse graphs, admittedly using different methodology, but they're still useful in certain areas. Um, I feel what's happening is that the older methods like graphical models are now being embedded or combined in different ways with neural nets. Either the networks are being used as inference in graphical models or, they, or the, the functions inside the graphical models themselves in neural nets, or both, right? Mm -hmm. you can, these are both feasible. So I'm adding, not really subtracting, and it's getting bigger. Yeah. And there is an issue that it might be so big, it, you just can't carry it, and it might get split into two. I'm okay. discussing that with my publisher. Right. Okay. It'll be like the PDP volumes eventually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually leaning towards the two volume yeah. solution. Um, uh -huh. And I've sort of structured it that way, where there's basically, you know, this is the, the uh, overview of the stuff that's widely used in practice and would make a good undergraduate book. Admittedly, quite a long one. Mm -hmm. And then a second part on the more open ended research, you know, generative models, RL, mm -hmm. um, more advanced material that relies on more mathematical machinery. Right. Like supervised learning, as it's practiced today, is basically design a network and fit it with SGD. Right. You don't need to know much. I yep. mean, Turn the which is, it, yeah. both, I mean, <laughs> it's good. And that explains, I think, the popularity of it is that the barriers to entry are super low, mm -hmm. right? Because the me methods are simple and the software is really good. Yeah. And now there's a lot of experimentation that's required and people come up with creative ideas like skip connections or batch mm -hmm. norm. Um, but these are, you know, they're not radical changes to the foundation and they're relatively easy to come up with on your own. But I think the newer, like if you asked me about us discussing over lunch with someone about sort of trends in the field, I mean, it was in the early days of machine learning, it was sort of neural nets and connectionism. Mm -hmm. And then people got dissatisfied and started doing SVMs and graphical models and things with more math, and the barrier to entry to the field went up, right? And then, and then neural nets came back in, and the barrier to entry has gone down. But now I feel like there's like more mathematical sophistication coming back because mm -hmm. we sort of, Neural nets work, but we don't know why, and people are working on theoretical understanding of that using techniques from you know, non convex optimization and non traditional optimization right. methods and um, you know, a variety of more sophisticated machinery. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so why don't you follow that trajectory forward? So I'm interested to hear what you think are the the big challenges, the couple big challenges, where the big advances are going to be in the next five, ten years, let's say. Well, I, I think, you know, I'm not the first to say it, but causality is obviously hot mm -hmm. and deservedly so, and, and at least that was the impression I got at NeurIPS, and um, something I've been interested in for a while, um, although I haven't been very active recently. So I think uh, there's a worry in the field that these networks, in part because they have so many parameters, are picking up on superficial mm -hmm. correlations in the data, so they're overfitting, they, they do seem to work quite well in the real world, but they're also somewhat fragile. And so if we could try to un uncover causal mechanisms, it would not just be useful in settings where we can intervene, but also it would help us get robustness. So I think that's gonna be a growing trend and um, one that I endorse. Um, you know, Uta Pearl, I think, has this quote that oh, all of machine learning is just curve fitting. Right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and you know, to a certain extent, that is true for machine learning as it's like currently practiced, say, in the industry. Um, I don't think that's a fair characterization of, research, you know, yeah. more research, you know, yeah. GANs and mm -hmm. RL and um, 
you know, neural Turing machines, differentiable programming, and these yeah. more, so that's not just code fitting. Right? Right. Right. These are processes that are being emulated, mm -hmm. um, and that's more than a curve, right? And, and there's, a, there's a whole spectrum of complexity there. Good, so just to get your perspective on a different thing, which is you've been somebody who's been, you know, went through academia and got your PhD, were a professor at UBC for a while, and now you've been at Google for six, seven, seven years. Seven years. Yeah. So just to hear what you have to th say about the academic kind of industrial lab differences. And I mean, the differences seem to be, you know, diminishing yeah. over time, at least in the current regime. You know, I'm in Google Research, and. <laughs> and I have the privilege to work on, on basic research and collaborate with academics and interns and, and publish a lot, but we also, of course, work with internal product teams. And I think, you know, the product teams know that they, you know, that one of the ways they might have an edge over the competition, am I allowed to say that on camera? <laughs> it's a competitive world, that's yeah. just how it is, right? We're a business. So we want to have the best technology for our users, and that often requires access to state-of-the-art methodology. Particularly going forward, as I think we're starting to plateau on um, how much we can squeeze out of labeled data, um, because you know there are things that are very hard for humans mm -hmm. to label, and data distributions are often non-stationary, and so we want systems that can adapt online, and this is going to require new methods, right? So I think industry is needs access to the latest research, and one way is to you know, have hybrid relationships, either they hire professors like me full time, or yeah. there are several colleagues of mine who have a foot in both camps. And I think many companies are doing that these days. Right. Um, and, you know, it's some of the work is, whether it's from an industry lab or an academic lab, is kind of hard to tell mm -hmm. the difference. Is there anything you miss about academia? I miss my office. <laughs> <laughs> An office with a door that closes. I, I'm not a fan of open plan. Uh -huh. and I know several people are not a fan of open plan. Uh, I understand the benefits of bringing people together. And, I see. And uh, being in a shared space and having high bandwidth communication, but I also uh, appreciate the benefits <laughs> of being able to have a silent place where... I see. So that's focus. the trick. So for academia to be successful, we need cubicles. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, private yeah, spaces. Private spaces, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm lucky I, you know, I have a, an accommodating manager who lets me work at home for a fraction of the time where yeah. I can, you know, did not check my email and, and just focus. And I think that's important. Um, but I also am lucky to live close enough to work that I can come in for team meetings and do the face-to-face. -face. Yeah. So, but that, that, that's a relatively minor thing. I think um, with academia, you know, in principle, you have sort of infinite freedom to do whatever you want, and you're not beholden to anyone. Of course, in practice, you have to write grants, and you have momentum, and you have commitments to, to students and things that you've promised to do. So um, in reality, everyone has constraints, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, in an in a industry position, I'm not really teaching, but I view like working on the book in some senses is scratching that edge. I, uh -huh. I enjoy right. um, communicating ideas to people, and in particular in, in written form. So I, I'm, I think I'm good at that, and I, I, I like the opportunity to do that. We have internal educational courses, and um, sometimes Googlers do like teach classes at neighboring mm -hmm. universities. Um, right. So yeah, I think the, the, the points on the spectrum and, and people sometimes, there's a bit of a revolving door, right? I've had, you know, Carl Von Rick was on my team now, he's a professor at Columbia, mm -hmm. so you know, there right. are people who come to go back for a while and, yeah. and go back to academia. Great, okay, it's a wrap.